The HIV epidemic in Uganda remains heterogeneous, affecting different population groups and different geographical uh, locations differently. As an example, six sub-regions in the country have an HIV prevalence higher than the national average. This includes the Greater Massacre, which is Taos of Uganda, at 8.3%, Mid-North, the Lango Achori region, at 6.7%, Kampara, at 6.9%, the southwestern region, Angkore Chigezi, at 6%, North of Uganda at 6%. All the rest have an HIV prevalence, which is less than average, uh, with West Nile at 2.3% and Kalamoja at 2.8%, having the lowest prevalence in the country. In terms of new HIV infections, we are seeing adolescent girls consistently uh, continuing to be uh, disproportionately affected. They are accounted for 636% of all new HIV infections, which is disproportionate. In second place, we notice that men, uncircumcised men, who were formerly married, divorced, separated, they take, they take second place in the number of new HIV infections. And in third place, we see formerly married women, divorced, separated women, taking the third uh, rank in the number of new HIV infections. In fourth place, we see children born to HIV-positive mothers, and we see female sex workers coming in later, but because they are few in number, but the HIV prevalence in that uh, population group is significantly high. We have also noted a slight increase in incidence among adolescent boys and young men. The prevalence among adolescent boys and young men has always been low compared to their female counterparts, but we are seeing a high incidence, a rising in number of new HIV infections, particularly among adolescent boys and young men who are uncircumcised. The National AIDS Can Write Memorial is commemorated on every third Sunday of May, that is every year. But in Uganda, we have chosen to commemorate ours, not on Sunday, but on Friday, May 17, 2020. <clears throat> the AIDS Can Write Memorial is an opportunity for us to honor those who dedicated their lives to helping people living with HIV and affected by HIV and to continue to mobilize our communities in solidarity. We know there is wealth of evidence that stigma and discrimination undermine HIV prevention and treatment programs. Stigma is discouraging our people from seeking HIV prevention services, testing for HIV, and starting and staying on HIV treatment. We stand in our way when our leaders of various categories oppose science and advance personal prejudices and opinions that sabotage evidence-based HIV control programs. An example, recently I went somewhere and I presented the six I've already told you, that men who are uncircumcised are being left, left behind. So so many uncircumcised men went on social media and the influential people, and they are advancing opposing opinions on the role of circumcision. So I said, okay, you stay there and are circumcised, we shall find out in the long term. So, so many influential leaders are voicing uh, oppositions that are contrary to science, sabotaging the condom program, sabotaging the prep program, sabotaging the circumcision program. I don't know whether they do it premeditatedly or inadvertently. We stand in the way when we show no compassion to people living with HIV or members of their families. We have learned that some of the reasons several people on HIV's treatment abandon treatment or do not show up for refills is because their families are not showing up, showing compassion. They must stay and do their part, their cause. Employers are not allowing our people, people living with HIV, a day off to go for refills. We stand in the way when we condone gender-based violence, not only against people living with HIV, but against women and other marginalized groups. Our demographical survey showed that 54% of ever married women reported that had ever experienced physical, sexual, and emotional violence. 54%, it almost involves your sister or your stepmother. In addition to the trauma and other harm done, this gender-based violence is an impediment to ending AIDS. It has been shown to increase the risk of acquiring HIV, impede use of HIV services and prevention tools, including treatment. 
it has been shown to worsen treatment outcomes. The theme of this year's event, you've been told, is ending AIDS, keeping communities at the center. You all remember those who participated in the recently concluded Kabaka run here in, uh, in this region. Again, our theme was almost close to this, but it only again brought up men that spearheaded by men. And as I will conclude, I will still ask the men to spearhead the struggle to end HIV and then AIDS in this country. Because it seems we have the upper hand in this effort and this war. Not because we are masicular and energetic, but because we are persuasive, we are economically empowered, so we are strong in all fields. And somehow, somewhere, we become the devil which I'm talking about. Especially to attract the communities which uh, my director talked about, and uh, mainly the young, the young ones. So as we communities are put in the front line, to res as responders, when AIDS was first discovered in Uganda, and was also known to be a death sentence, you remember that time when we were growing up, the moment you could be declared a victim, I don't know if that word is applies, but the moment they find you positive, you remember those words which Madame was talking about of stigma, they say start preparing a, a, a spade and a what? And a hole to make your grave. So it was a death sentence, which I believe because of the many, many efforts done by various people, including the, some of the first organizations which came up, like the AIDS uh, support organization, TASO, and others, this was also dismissed a bit. And that's why this morning we are pre- uh, privileged to have a testimony from a person who has been a champion about this stigma and we really appreciate and adore you Dr. Otiti for living the two lives.